What if the speed of light was 30 miles an hour? What if Earth had two suns? Which cereal mascot would win in a what fight? What if everyone lived underground? What if it rained? What if money grew on trees? What if could fly? I don't know if that would actually happen. It's much easier to store a unicycle than to store a horse. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Absurd Hypotheticals, the show where we overthink dumb questions so you don't have to. I'm your host, Marcus Lehner, and I'm joined here today by Chris Yee and Ben Storms. Say hi, guys. Hey, I'm Chris. Hey, I'm Ben. Guys, we have ourselves another sports question this week. We're going to explore all the ways that we can improve tennis. We're on a sports streak. We did football yes, uh, last week. Yeah, now football's over, so now we need to fill it in with another sport, which I guess is tennis. (laughs) (laughs) Randomly, for no reason. Are there any actual, are there any other major sports going on right now? Like, is basketball happening? Basketball is happening. Currently, as we're recording this, but not by the time this is coming out, the Winter Olympics are happening, which in retrospect was a big miss on us for having a themed episode. (laughs) Uh, They do not play tennis in the Winter Olympics. (laughs) They don't. That would be awesome. Did anyone do? Did anyone do winter tennis? No. Ice tennis. <laughs> Ice tennis. Ice tennis would be awesome. I have played tennis in a blizzard before. Why? That was exceedingly dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that was like one of those weird, just like late fall, just like it's just gonna snowstorm hard for like an hour and then be done and melt immediately. But we were playing tennis while it started, and we just played and like probably like. You know, half an inch to an inch of snow had accumulated, like, on the court as we were doing it. And it got incredibly slippery because they were yeah, concrete courts. Yeah, that sounds so dangerous. Yikes. Fun as heck. No one died. <laughs> <laughs> so that's good. But yeah, we've done, we've improved sports before. Um, it's kind of a, a recurring episode that we do here. So we just take tennis, find ways to make it absurd and better. Uh, and Chris, we're going to start off with you and how you improve tennis. Yes. So I've actually never played tennis, interestingly enough. But I have watched tennis on TV. And personally, when I'm watching tennis, my favorite part is when they have the really, really long rallies. I think that's like, that's the most exciting part. So I looked at the longest rally that's ever happened. And according to the Guinness Book of World Records, it happened in 2017. I don't think it was during an actual like official game, but they were like, they were setting out to actually break this record. So it was broken by Simone Frediani and... Danielle Pecci. And the rally was 51,283 strokes. What? <laughs> yeah. Wow. It what? Last- <laughs> it lasted 12 hours and 37 minutes. And they actually had to wear backpacks full of water to stay hydrated. <laughs> when you're doing that, when someone messes up and it ends, are you sad or happy? I think you're happy anywhere after like the two and a half hour mark. So yeah. ecstatic. Well, Probably it depends yeah. on what the, the previous record is. If they didn't break the record, I assume mad. <laughs> I guess that's that's true. Yeah, fair. I imagine the guy has like one of those like click counters that only but it only has like four digits, so he gets to like nine thousand nine hundred and ninety nine. He's like Frog. No, that's where you put up the <laughs> second click counter and clicks that one once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I also don't know if um if they ate anything, because it is twelve hours. That's a long time to go without eating anything. They didn't mention anything about food, but they did mention the water thing. So I feel like you couldn't. Like how how would you how would you eat while rallying? I don't know. I mean it's probably wasn't that intensive a game. Like they're probably hitting it pretty easily for the other person to hit back. Yeah. So Maybe they had someone walk in and hand them food or something. <laughs> I mean, it, you can you can do a one-handed stroke. You could like eat a burrito with your free hand. <laughs> God, that just feels so risky. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Look, if you want to, if you want to be a winner, Ben, sometimes you got to eat a burrito in one hand. <laughs> I feel like the want to be a winner, just don't eat. Then I don't know. Anyway, continue, Chris. Anyway, so that was the longest rally, and I wanted to encourage long rallies in my game of improved tennis so usually if you're like watching a game and someone just hits the net it just stops the ball and it's really disappointing because it stops the rally and everything has to reset and everything like that so i wanted to end that i want to instead of stopping the ball i want to make the net bouncy so it bounces back at you when you hit the net so you're still punished basically if you hit the net because it bounces back at you and you have to hit it again and then i started to think like normally you're like trying to avoid the net usually 
But what if you're not trying to avoid the net? What if the whole point of the game is you're trying to hit the net? So I sort of changed this so the net is like a movable thing. Every time you hit the net, it moves towards your opponent based on like how hard you hit it, like momentum based. So like if you hit it harder, it moves further. And instead of points, it's just whenever you get the net to your opponent's side at the end, then they lose. And then I started to think about this a little more. It didn't really make entirely a lot of sense with just one net, one like giant net moving toward your opponent, because then like their section of the court gets smaller and smaller and it's basically impossible for them to win. <laughs> yeah. Also, they're pretty good at hitting something 51,000 times in a row. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So instead of one giant net, I decided to break up the net into different sections. I don't know how many different sections, maybe like 10 on the court or something. But each of these sections will move independently of each other. So, And then each section will represent a point. So if you move one of these sections to the end of the court, then you gain a point and it locks in place. So you're, that is now permanently your point. But what this does is it makes... It, it requires some accuracy. So, you like, if you, like, you need to hit specific spots so that you can gain certain points. And if one of the sections of the net moves behind you, then I think you can go in front of it to try to defend it so that, like, your opponent can't hit hit that part with, with the ball. Now, I want to add, still add a punishment for, like, ending the rally, like, if you miss the ball. So... If you miss the ball, then your opponent gets to choose which section they want to move forward a little bit. That way, say, like, you only have one section of the net left to defend. Instead of just standing in front of that net so that your opponent can't hit it ever, they can hit it away from it and force you away. So you you still actually have to hit the ball back. And that just, like, encourages more long rallies. Now, I started to think about this. It's sort of similar to... A childhood game of mine called Crossfire. I don't know if either of you played that. No, I've not. I don't think so. Well, it's a. I think it was a '90s. It might have been introduced in the '80s, but I I was born in the '90s, so it sounds very familiar. I'm gonna. Yeah. I'm looking it up so I can see it. It's basically there's like a board that you're like it's a board game, but there's a little metal ball that has like a triangle around it in the middle, and there's two guns on either side that each shoot metal balls. They're like ball bearing type things. You're shooting towards the ball in the middle. You're trying to hit that ball to the other side and you're like shooting it back and forth. Oh, this is the, this is one of those games that everybody else, like whenever I went to somebody else's house, like they would have it, but it never had all the components. So I never got to actually play the real one, but it always <laughs> looked so cool that I wanted it. <laughs> this also feels like the most late eighties, early nineties, someone's going to get horribly injured by this game thing I've ever seen. <laughs> I mean, all the commercials are really intense, but I mean, actually playing the game wasn't that intense, <laughs> but it was still fun. Also, I don't know about like the choking hazard stuff because those ball bearings are you could easily swallow them. But anyway, I sort of wanted to make it a little... I want to make tennis a little more like Crossfire or my version of tennis. Because right now, with one ball, it's pretty one-sided. Like, you could... One person could win the entire game without the other person ever getting a chance to hit the ball at all. So I just wanted to have multiple balls. That kind of solves it. So, like, each team, each person serves a ball at the same time then you have two balls going at the same time who knows maybe you could add more than two balls but that might get a little bit crazy so maybe just stick with two balls at first and that way like you have the sections of the net going back and forth instead of just going one way and then finally a big part of tennis not the actual sport but like a big part of i guess televised tennis is the ball people like the ball boy and the ball girl uh the people that pick up the ball when it hits the net so that there's no like big break in the action. I want to integrate them in some somehow into the game. So my idea is that each side will have their own ball person. They'll basically be part of the team. And every time a ball becomes stagnant on the court and it's just like sitting there, they do have to run in and get it. And if they successfully get it, they can give it to their player and their player can serve the ball. And it's basically you have an extra hit on one of the nets. But the thing is, they have to dodge, like, this is in the middle of the big rally. So they have to dodge all the tennis balls going back and forth. If they don't, 
then you get penalized and you get to move the net a little bit. So it's a big game of dodging balls and hitting nets. And I think it's better. And I think probably you'll get a lot, a lot more rallies and stuff, maybe. Or it might just be way too chaotic. I don't know. <laughs> I like how, I like how you started. I, yeah, I like how you started with. I'm gonna make this more consistent rallies, and kind of got there, and then just went just down the chaos. Right. Tree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I realized that at the very end, it might be too chaotic to have long rallies. But oh well. <laughs> I still think it's. I'd better. watch it. Yeah. Anyway, Ben, what did you do? So I my sort of goal coming into this, I didn't know, and I think Mark and I kind of talked about this a little bit. It's kind of hard to make tennis better because tennis is a pretty, A, a pretty good game and B, a game that just doesn't have a whole lot of moving parts to it. So there's a lot fewer things to tweak than on a lot of the sports that we've, we've done this with before. Yeah. If, if, if you listen to previous episodes, I, I find major flaws <laughs> in, in, in a lot of professional sports that I weirdly form very strong opinions about once I start like going Incredibly into it. Incredibly strong opinions. It's, it's baffling, <laughs> honestly. So, so once I couldn't find any like, like obvious, you know, improvement like that to make, I said, okay, if I can't necessarily make it better, I want to make it bigger, which technically there kind of is a way to make tennis bigger, which is just doubles tennis. But honestly, in terms of making tennis bigger, double, double tennis kind of sucks, right? It's like two extra people. And even though you're adding like one other person per side, the course only gain like a third bigger. So like you're covering much less ground. I don't know. It's just, it's not a great implementation of tennis, but bigger. So we can, we can do better than that. The first way I went that I sadly could not make work was giant robot tennis. I really wanted it to work. How could you not make that work? <laughs> well, no. So like, okay. Yes. Technically I could say, oh yeah, you have giant robots that play tennis, but none of the, like, I, what I was looking into was like, the, you know, people have made big fighting robots and stuff. Not like Robot Wars ones, but like actual ones that people are inside of, right? But those just don't have the mobility that you need to play tennis. Like you could technically play tennis with them, but it wouldn't be a very good sport because they just can't move that fast. So it would kind of just be whoever can not hit it first, which isn't a very good sport, right? Like it just, yes, technically I could say, yes, we have fast moving robots or whatever and say, yeah, that works. But I want to do that idea justice when we have actually good robots. So we're not going to do that. Stay tuned for our updated tennis episode once the world, real world invites, in, invents agile giant robots. Yes. Have you seen the robot pro wrestling? Oh, those robots are pretty awesome. <laughs> those are, but those are also like four inches tall. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Right? Like that's that's not giant. That's small tennis. That's, that's tiny <laughs> tennis. <laughs> right? So like it just doesn't, it just doesn't work. So, so I want to scale back a little bit. And then once I'd gone down that road, that obviously has a lot of financial backing need for all of it. And I wanted to... And additionally, make tennis be a little more approachable because technically tennis is cheap, right? All you need is a racket and a near nearby court, and it's not that like hard to play. But the problem is tennis has a very high skill floor, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. But going on Chris's point of like rallies are cool, if you're a, you know, beginner tennis player, your rally is like four hits. You get to like six and you're like ecstatic, right? Like it's not really like playing tennis, you know, like someone really playing tennis right like it can be fun but it's you know it's just a very weird set of skills that are very hard to get into right so that's why i was like okay what if we could change the game actions of tennis to, to ones that are just a little more common to other sports and then i thought wait a minute what if we just wholesale stole the game actions from a different sport and also the field that was bigger which is where i got to soccer <laughs> So <laughs> what if, what if tennis was just play soccer? soccer instead? <laughs> what if no? It's not just soccer instead. But what what if tennis? But <laughs> we're gonna soccer. remove the nets, make the make the courts grass again, and then <laughs> no, no, uh, we're gonna no. put two goals. <laughs> we're still gonna have nets. We're still gonna have nets. So all right. So you go go to a field. All right. We go to a field. I actually wound up not using a soccer field because it's a little bit too big. I wound up going with a football field. It's just it's just slightly smaller. For nets, I wound up using badminton nets, which were about five feet tall at the top. Which is actually shorter than I thought. I think we usually play badminton just with like a volleyball net, which is apparently wrong. I didn't know that. But I figured that was a good height because you could still do like bicycle kicks near the net and shit. And that'd be just cool. So let's do cool stuff. So you have your you have your field. You have a line of nets, I guess, across the across the middle of the field. You have two teams. 
you're going to have your serve, right? Your serve is very simple. Sort of just a goal kick from in the box. So not necessarily easy for the every man to do, but possible, right? Okay. You serve the ball, gets over there. Obviously now we're going to have to change things slightly because you have a very large field, even if you have a pretty big team. And just your good old, you know, one bounce and then you're out is not necessarily great in terms of having a nice flowing game. Additionally, the other rule that I want to get rid of, which I'm not going to tell you get rid of that, we'll get to that. Normally in tennis, you can only hit the ball once per, like, shot. That sounds like a really stupid statement. You can't hit the ball twice while you're returning it. Yeah, you can't volleyball it. Yeah, exactly. I want to be able to volleyball because that's cool. And once again, we're trying to make this cool. So... I figure you, you're going to get, and I entirely, once again, just making these up, but this, I felt like, flowed reasonably well. You get two ground bounces, and you get up to three touches per bounce. So you can say, you know, when the ball is coming in, you can, like, hit it on your chest, drop it down to your knee, and then, like, kick it over to someone where it can bounce once, and they can do sort of the same and then return it, right? That all makes sense? Uh, yeah. I think so. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so we have the game here in terms of team sizes i couldn't figure out exactly what you'd want relative to a like tennis court a football field is about 22 times bigger sorry 44 times bigger so you would need 22 players per side to have the same coverage you can probably do less than that because of you know having multiple bounces and the ball will be moving a little bit more slowly but i figure you know roughly like 10 to 15 players per team can make it work. And then what you kind of have is this half volleyball, half tennis, half soccer, you know, passing the ball back and forth to set up like a header down, you know, like a, as a, like a spike over the net or a bicycle kick at the front or, you know, just like a big volley from the middle or something. This is petering out a lot faster than I expected. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it. I, I, was just, I wasn't sure if you were actually d winding out. I am, which I didn't expect to yet. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> Quick, vamp with me. Do you have ball people? <laughs> have, you, have you seen... Um, they ha have you ever seen the people play table tennis with soccer, like with soccer ball and soccer yes. rules? That's actually... I was looking up to see if anyone had actually, like, gotten any bigger than that. And the biggest thing I could find was I've seen people do like little tiny fields with like a little net that's maybe like a foot up and then a little box that's maybe like 10 square feet on each side with like little ropes around. And there's like playing soccer tennis in that, which feels hilarious to me. It's always, it's always crazy to me like how good the ball control is of like, I'll just say most Europeans, <laughs> most yes. non-Americans because everyone yeah. just plays soccer. People who actually play like, soccer. Yeah. <laughs> so my, my family's from Germany, so, so I visit there fairly often and it's like always a weird culture shock moment where you know i'm just hanging out with a bunch of like guys my age or what was my age like you know late teens early 20s and we'd be like playing soccer and we'd just be, like standing around the soccer ball before we start and they just like start doing like you know ball dribbling where they like bounce it off their knees and their and their feet and everything and just like every single one of them has like tricks and is good yep and i'm like oh i can do none of these things <laughs> see and if if soccer tennis were i think people would be able to do those things because you have another reason to aside from just showing off yeah exactly it's perfect i don't know i don't have an endpoint to this guys i'm not gonna lie <laughs> <laughs> it's big well that means it's my turn then it is marcus's turn then and i went in exactly the opposite direction tiny it's robot small. soccer oh <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i was i was kind of going through um my starting point was kind of going through like the different variation of tennis exists after I gave up after being like, well, my problem with tennis is that it's too hard to learn and there's the unforced error. So making the game easier didn't really like seem like a fun way for me to go down. So I started looking at the other ones like there's squash and badminton and pickleball. But the one I find the most fun, and I'll say this, more fun than tennis itself is table tennis, which given two data points of, you know, fun versus size of tennis and table tennis, we can conclude that the smaller you make tennis, the more fun it is. So Ben's tennis is very boring. Bad news for soccer tennis. <laughs> yeah, so soccer tennis is going to be the most boring version of tennis. And what I'm about to propose is going to be the most ultimate, exciting version of tennis. So what is the smallest scale that we can play tennis at? Conveniently, the world is chock full of incredibly tiny little yellow balls called electrons. 
So I want to see, can we play tennis with electrons at a molecular scale? Can we, not even a molecular scale, an atomic scale, can we play tennis? Are they yellow? Canonically, not probably actually. no. But in most diagrams, yes. That's actually an interesting question. Are electrons yellow? Who knows? I feel like they can't be, right? Like They're generally not visible, but they would reflect, they technically would reflect light, and it could technically be at a wavelength that is yellow, I guess. Would, would they reflect? Because, like... They are, it's really complicated, which is going to just amble into this paragraph I've written where I'm going to preface this entire section with a pretty strong acknowledgement that all the stuff I'm getting into is incredibly complex, non-intuitive field that I've, you know, worked to try and decipher in about four hours. So some of these things I'm about to say may ultimately be wrong, and there's going to be a good little list of caveats at the end. But the idea is to see if this idea is feasible rather than, like, actively practical with what we know. Which is probably no. (laughs) well you'll see so first things first atoms are small like really 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 small (laughs) if you scaled up an atom to the size of say i don't know a tennis ball and then made like a single cell out of atoms of that size that single cell would be about the size of a small town aka it's small enough that trying to make visualizations for it is not even helpful anymore (laughs) just ridiculously tiny but we're actually not bad at manipulating them. So if you look at atoms, we're actually able to move them pretty effectively. And for a while, too. Uh, There was a famous, um, I guess you can call it an experiment, that a famous demonstration by IBM, where they they were able to arrange 35 xenon atoms to spell out IBM, like at a nanoscale. They did this in 1989. Before we were born. Wow. Before, yeah, before we were even born, not to age us out of the spot, out, out of, I don't know, people judging us by age. I already said I was born in the 90s, so I gotta <laughs> really? stick, like this episode? stick to the lore. Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> so how do, we, how do we move atoms around? How do we actually, like, move something this small? Generally speaking, we're able to move them by having a really, really tiny needle which still is big compared to the atoms we're moving around. And then we get this needle very close to the atoms that we want to move. And we, then we let the small scale uh, electromagnetic forces kind of pick up the atom that we, so that we can manipulate it from then. So almost like a, uh, like a magnetic pencil kind of thing. You just put it in and then it can pick up the small little atoms and you can kind of move them around with that needle. But atoms are actually just much bigger than electrons anyway and are more fiddly so can we manipulate a single electron have we come from 1989 moving xenon around to being able to move electrons and the answer is yeah they have been able to basically the way they do it is they still have the the tiny needle which has become a bit smaller and more precise but still like on a bigger scale and what they've done is they've designed the needle tip so that it can go near a silicon atom instead of picking up the whole atom it'll actually reorient that silicon atom in such a way that it encourages the outside electron from the silicon atom to hop from the silicon onto the tip of the needle. And it can, then it kind of like hangs on that needle, that loose, singular loose electron. So we can manipulate an individual electron, but having an electron on just the needle doesn't really get us to, you know, the sport of tennis. <laughs> so what we really need is getting some some like live motion of these electrons and an actual court for us to play on. Conveniently, a lot of these nanoscale type experiments are actually done on like flat crystalline structures, oftentimes uh, graphene. And graphene makes basically just a nice symmetrical flat hexagonal structure that is with the goal of being simple and stable enough that when you mess with stuff on it, it doesn't really interfere. So from there, the, the laboratory of solid state physics in Switzerland ran some studies of free electron flow through a single atom thick graphene structure. So basically they have these loose electrons that kind of go on this on this flat surface and they kind of like weave in between these hexagons of graphene. Uh, and what's interesting is that they kind of flow through almost like a liquid. Like if you have a, a stream of electrons, they actually kind of just flow through kind of set paths. And what manipulates those paths will be impurities in the grid. So if you have a non-graphene element in there, 
it'll create create like a imperfection in the grid surface and the electron will actually can bounce off of those impurities. So to play our sport of tennis on a nanoscale, you set up a hexagonal grid, one atom thick of graphene. You capture your electron with a needle. You introduce it into your graphene structure. And then with the need, each play, each each person, each competitor would have their own needle with a impurity with a different type of molecule on it. And then as the electron goes through, they would insert that impurity into the grid at the appropriate spot to bounce the electron back and forth to the other side so that the, the electron eventually lands and stays on the opponent's side of the court. There's obviously some caveats here. <laughs> <laughs> what is the mechanism for moving the, whatever, the needle, needle thing? So it's moved mechanically, like it is like just moved very precisely. I, I believe it's just, it would be like similar to like a 3D printing type thing where it's just a very precise mechanical movement, like, you know, programmed movement, not like a dude holding a needle. Right. <laughs> so someone would just have control of that computer or whatever. Yeah, someone probably con- would control the computer. It kind of leads into my caveats. Um, first one, it's kind of tough to see how precise and like real time moving these atoms around is because the studies kind of go back. I mean, they, they've been doing this technique since 1989 in kind of very different forms and fashions. And in researching, it's kind of tough to tell what like the modern methods are and how good they are compared to old ones. Some of them talk about, you know, long setup times for the optics and the like setup of the needle to actually be at the precise levels it needs to be. Like you have to like move it, then stop and reevaluate and like reprogrammed in order to move it again. But some of them didn't seem like they were doing that. Like they were just kind of manipulating it more freely. So caveat number one, probably you probably won't be able to keep up with an electron <laughs> with, <laughs> with the with with the needle that you're moving and trying to bounce it back and forth. Another interesting thing is observing it, of, you know, actually watching the match. Generally, the, the fancy needles that they use to manipulate the electrons are also the what they're using to observe the structure. So, the, like, the feedback that the needle gets as it gets close to the structure will actually also be what they're using to measure what they're doing. So, like, the visibility is around the needle. It doesn't seem like it actually impacts the grid, that it would ruin the grid, but I'm not sure if that process of observing around the area like would impact the something like the electrons floating around so that's another one introducing a single electron into the graphene is also kind of a question mark um the studies that were using the graphene to study the flow were using a whole bunch of electrons with uh kind of an overall magnetic field i think to kind of push them from side to side kind of tricky and there may be other options the one that i was looking into that I thought was my initial idea. This is one I, that I learned, like had learned about before, is using lasers to bombard electrons to slow them down. So when they actually super cool atoms, when they you know when they get this you know trap a single atom and you know get it down to like you know theoretical absolute zero, what they what they do is they bombard the molecule with lasers to lo- to slow it down. So like you know temperature is basically the measure of how fast molecules are moving around. And if you hit them head on with a laser, it'll slow them down. And that's how you get these tiny, tiny temperatures. And I thought that it was kind of measured and automated, like it would, you know, shoot a specific laser against the atom moving around. But actually what they do is they just put six lasers around like X, Y, Z coordinates that are shooting at each other to kind of create a like center point where there's lasers coming in from all opposite directions, kind of compressing it. So... I thought the laser was going to be the way to move the ball around, but it looks like it's not precise enough to actually hit something singular or at like an angle that you'd want without being part of a whole system. One other interesting bit, I'm just sharing interesting bits I learned. On this hexagonal grid, at low temperatures, the impurities control where the electrons bounce off of. At higher temperatures, what actually bounces the electrons around is phonons, which is effectively vibrations in the lattice. So if you have, imagine your hex, you have the lines connecting the nodes, those lines vibrating are what will actually bounce the electron around. It appears to be a poorly understood phenomenon that is generally random. It's just like energy in the system that, you know, exhibits itself in random vibrations. But if you control those phonons, instead of having, introducing these like single points on the nodes with new molecules, 
you could create like a little wall that would bounce off and you could basically create nano pong where you'd have flat <laughs> <laughs> flat lines materializing on either side of the lattice structure bouncing the electron back and forth which would be super goddamn cool i mean regardless of whether your whole idea works or not nano pong is a cool improvement to the name of tennis <laughs> nano pong <laughs> would be a freaking cool sport so that's where i'm going to conclude on that absolute scientific victory <laughs> And there you have it, guys. That's you make you improve tennis by making it small, not big. Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> and with that, that'll that'll push us over to our would you rather question of the day. Marcus, would you? Are you ready for a would you rather? I am ready for a would you rather. Are you ready for the show format? <laughs> <laughs> I don't normally do this, so I'm not used to it. Would you rather paint your walls with a toothbrush or brush your teeth with a paintbrush? How often do I have to brush my teeth with a paintbrush? Like, is it just one time or is it like for a, like a month or something? I would say I'm trying to think of what would make it more even. So how long would it take to paint your walls with a toothbrush? How, I'll say you have to brush your teeth for a month with a paintbrush or you have to paint your entire house with a toothbrush. Entire Jesus, the whole house? house? Entire, entire inside of your house. Like... Or I guess maybe just one room. One, one room. room. One room. Honestly, one room. <laughs> one room feels like it's already going to be pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. Let's say one room. <laughs> okay. I'm going to start by thinking how bad, it, how bad is it to brush your teeth with a paintbrush? That's the, that's the first question. It has to be one of, like, the type of paintbrush that you would paint your walls with. That's probably yeah, yeah, what yeah, I was yeah. asking. Yeah. It's not going to be great. Your gums aren't going to love you a lot. And you're probably not going to get your entire mouth. Can you even brush the backs of your teeth? Yeah, I don't think you can. I mean, you might be able to. I think you get enough. I think if you just go at your teeth, it's going to get most sides poorly. I don't think there's any areas you won't reach. It just You're just not going to get any of them very well. And you are going to destroy your gums, probably. Oh, yeah. How long do you think it would take to paint a room with a, a toothbrush? If you're just like at it like four hours a day like a month like and how <laughs> it's so like i guess i don't know how well you have to paint your walls either because it's not going to be a good job it's, yeah it's not going to work very well so here's what here's what i'm thinking with the paint if i was paintbrush painting my wall you mean to you gotta do a mural because if you just paint it monocolor like if you're gonna spend this much time on it if you're gonna paint it monocolor one it'll look bad and two you'll go insane you will literally go insane you will literally lose your mind as you dip, dab your toothbrush into the paint bucket for, like, the four billionth time to do another, like, one square inch of wall. And you're going to do that for weeks, and then you're going to be like, needs a second coat, and then your madness will be complete. Are you going to do a base coat for your mural, or...? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Answer, no. Because, you know, even in real life, when you're like, do I need a base coat on this? You really always just want to say no. Like, you're just like, oh, these these paints nowadays are like, you know, they come with built-in base coat, built-in primer, right? <laughs> and even if that's not true, you convince yourself of it anyway. And you can always, you always say, oh, I can just do one more, one more coat if needed. So if you're doing a really cool Dean Depth mural, it can become like a little bit of your hobby. Even if it doesn't come out great, at least it'll be like a lot of fine detail for something the scale of a wall. I think if you don't do it that way, you have to do the brushing your teeth because you lose your mind. Yeah, I mean, that definitely makes it better instead of just normally painting your wall. I mean, unless you like just go into like audio, like, get real into audiobooks or something while you're while you're doing it, get real into podcasts. You can just listen to the entire catalog of absurd hypotheticals while you paint your walls. I mean, it'll just be a mindless task that you're doing. So yeah, you could multitask with audio. How, how bad would it actually be? Like how long I'm I'm just thinking about like I guess you can you're gonna be able to there's not as much paint is going to go into a toothbrush as it does into an actual paintbrush, is it? That's kind of your big problem. Right. Each dip of the toothbrush is gonna be a lot like what's the percentage of coverage that a toothbrush covers compared to a paintbrush? Uh like two? <laughs> two percent. <laughs> I wouldn't maybe maybe like yeah, maybe like two. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like it's like it's like a quarter of the thickness and then like you know an eighth of the length or something so it's like yeah 30 
something times smaller. Yeah. God, that's gonna be really bad, huh? You're also gonna have to go through a lot of toothbrush, a lot of toothbrushes. You're, they're gonna wear down. They are gonna wear down. I mean, that's not a huge. That's actually not a huge hassle. Like you can buy fifty toothbrushes for not a lot of money. Yeah, I think the brushing your teeth with a paintbrush, though. I think you're not gonna like your mouth is gonna hurt during that month. Probably like you're gonna destroy your gums. I don't think you're gonna get full coverage of like the back of your teeth and everything, and like the back of your corners of your mouth so you're probably gonna have some dental health issues i guess that's the question right are you are you going to cause actual damage to your mouth by brushing your teeth with a paintbrush because if you i think you might yeah i don't think it's guaranteed but i think you might i think there's a chance if you get like a good like when you first open a paintbrush the bristles are fairly soft like Next day, I mean, once they're dry with paint, they suck. Like, you have like a, like a, you know, the brush you get out of your garage and try to clean off. That one will cut up your mouth. But a brand new one, if it's just water and toothpaste, like might get you, might have a shot of getting you there. Uh, spreading toothpaste, though, actually is not super easy. It's just like a little bit too thick. I'm just picturing the, like the maneuver that I have to do to get the back of my teeth. <laughs> like, I was, I, to... I was game playing it a little bit and it's not great. Yeah, you kind of have to like open your mouth, maybe like tilt your head back and like, I don't know, push, push your head back with the paintbrush. Is it, is it more efficient with like a four inch brush? And you just like jam it in like full mouth width and just like go back and forth. The back top isn't that bad. The back bottom I'm having trouble with. Oh, yeah. The bottom's a lot harder than the top, actually. Yeah. Also, what is the dentist going to say if you go to your dentist within that month? He's probably like, you got to do better. No change from last time. <laughs> uh, he's going to ask, have you been flossing? And it'll be completely unrelated to the hypothetical. I'll be like, not like I should. <laughs> the thing is with the with the toothbrush or with the brushing your teeth with a paintbrush, that's a finite amount of time. And it's only a month. The toothbrush painting, I think it keeps on going until you're done. So it could go for longer than a month. I don't know exactly how long it would take, but I feel like it would take longer than a month in general. I I don't think so. No? I guess it depends on how much time you have to do it each day. <laughs> yeah, co- incorporating into my real life, adult life, it would probably be like three months of pretty much most of my free time going to it. Again, I the, the month of bad hi- dental hygiene is a finite, it's not that, that long an amount of time, like... If you just didn't brush your teeth for a month, you might develop a few cavities. It would not be good, but, like, it wouldn't be, like, your whole mouth rots out. What if it was three months? Yeah, if it was three months, then that's that's actually a lot worse. Because then you probably will get cavities. Yeah, I mean, I'm leaning, I'm leaning, I'm leaning towards the wall painting if I can do a mural. If I can't do a mural, I can't do the wall painting. Because my teeth can do whatever they want, but I can't afford the psychosis. So I'm on team toothbrush. No, team toothbrush painting. Toothbrush painting. Paint <laughs> right. <laughs> I realize toothbrush doesn't answer. Doesn't team say team toothbrush, not team brush teeth. Just to keep it clear. <laughs> I think if it's at one month, I will go with toothbrush painting. Uh, no, uh, I think if it's one month, I think. I'll, sorry, I think if it's one month, I'm gonna go with paintbrush toothing. <laughs> if it were up to three months i would have to do a toothbrush painting okay i think i am leaning towards it's really close for me but i think i'm leaning a little towards the toothbrush painting because i just don't have faith in myself to do the the toothbrushing oh, this is really confusing the brushing my teeth uh the brush to like competently yes. Yeah, the brush toothing. <laughs> Plus, Chris, because you edit the podcast, you have uh, experience with painful, repetitive processes. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's going to like mess up my mouth, and that's that just means it's harder to eat things, which I like eating things. Oh, I do like eating things, too. You can eat things while you paint. So I choose the, the painting. Awesome. Well, there you have it, folks. That is what we would do. Wait, <laughs> if we had to pick between toothbrush and brush, te- did you not pick Ben? No, I no, did. did. What if it would it change things if you could use an electric toothbrush? Ooh, that'd probably make it a worse paint job. <laughs> it would, but it'd be faster. Would it? I don't know if it would. It would at least be less repetitive motion. 
It might actually be a really cool design then. I think that, I mean, I, I landed on paint the wall anyway, so I might use an electric toothbrush as a phone, but I think it's against the spirit of the thing. Fair enough. <laughs> what is in the spirit of the thing, and the thing being this podcast, is to send us questions. Uh, if you have a cool idea for a hypothetical question, send it our way. Absurdhypotheticals at gmail.com is the best way to send us your idea. Or in the comments if you're on YouTube. And we would love to get you more listener questions, and we are very happy to do them. And then you'll be immortalized forever on your favorite podcast. Can't get better than that. And it's free. Also can't get better than that. Other free things to do if you can't think of a question, or if you've already sent a question and looking for something else to do, leave us a review. It always helps to have extra reviews for the show. It helps the search algorithms, helps us pop up more people's feeds, help the show grow. And makes us feel very, very warm and fuzzy inside. That's the main reason. But we, we're not supposed to say that on the air. So on whatever podcast player you listen to, whether that be iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play or the internet or YouTube. <laughs> or the internet. All those other things weren't on the internet. Yeah. How are they going to do, how are they going to lose a review if it's on the internet? All reviews are on the internet. Don't mail us a review. That's not, that's a waste of everyone's time. <laughs> <laughs> and then the ultimate, if you want to help out in the ultimate way. Freaking cold hard cash, baby. www.patreon.com slash absurd hypotheticals. Become a patron. Uh, for just $1 a month, you can become a patron and you get access to all our bonus content that we produce each month specifically for our patrons. And yeah, that gets you more content. Bonus episodes, supports the show. It's all good and easy. So go do that. There's no reason not to. But in any case, after you've done all those things, uh, you are welcome to listen to our episode next week where we answer the following question what if batman's gadgets were real mm-hmm.